In this video, we are going to talk about why study for ethics at all. Many students who are preparing for UPSC have this question. It makes them think that if, if they are preparing for GS 1, 2, 3, keeping track of current affairs, already preparing for essay very well, it will automatically prepare them for ethics. And after all, it is test for what you stand for, what is ethical, what is not. So why to study? Although there is a prescribed syllabus, if you just skim through it once, get to know yourself with some ideas, acquaint yourself with some basic ideas, that will be enough. Today we are going to talk about some questions that are often asked to teachers who teach ethics. Some questions that have always come across from students, I have listed them as frequently asked questions. Because in my career of teaching ethics from its year of commencement, there are questions that students always have about ethics and I thought it's a good idea to put all of them together. So somebody who is either new or either confused or either thinking about how to do this can look at it and perhaps some of your questions will get solved. Let's look at first question. Are there right and wrong answers in ethics? Isn't each individual free to choose his or her ethics? Now. It is correct that every individual can have his or her opinions. But for the sake of examination, it is true that there are right or wrong answers. If there are no right or wrong answers, how can anyone evaluate you and how can anyone give you marks? So surely there are right or wrong answers. Surely there are things which we can call them as something which you should stand by because it is right and something you can absolutely should say is wrong because it does not support some of the ideas like let's say constitutional values we can't say if anybody who is going against constitutional values i still support it because my ethics says so there is nothing which can tell you that there should be a very clear idea of right and wrong there can be perceptions there can be opinions but then when you study ethics you need to give justifications for your opinions. You need to give justifications for what perceptions you hold to be true. Let's move on to the next question. Do we have to write idealistic answers or practical answers? Now, when students ask these questions, I see there is some basic confusion between thinking that what is idealistic cannot be practical and vice versa. For example, ethics will never ask you to do something which can't be done. It will ask you to do something, things, take actions, take decisions which are in itself doable. Many times people get confused between what is right and what is easy. We, don't, we are not here to choose easy which might seem practical. We are here to choose what is right. Now when we say idealistic, what is so wrong about being idealistic? Idealistic just means having ideals, having very firm opinions about how things should be done knowing what principles you want to live by, take decisions by. So surely we need to have answers which are ethical, practical as well as idealistic. Right? Let's move on to the next question. Do we have to quote philosophers in all answers? Now look again, as said before, it is test for what you think is ethical, what you think is not ethical. However, studying moral philosophers, thinkers from all over the world makes you more aware about what is right and wrong and how right and wrong is perceived. It widens your horizon. In addition to that, if you add some philosophers ideas, quote them, it only enhances, reinforces your answer. However, it's not necessary that you always in all answers have to quote uh, philosophers. Of course, it's appropriate you can justify your stand through a thinker, but then sometimes justifications can just be conceptual, sometimes they can be historical, and sometimes they can be just topical in nature. Right? Let's go to the next question. Will taking philosophy as an optional help in ethics paper? That is another question that gets asked very often. To this question, I'm going to say to an extent, not always. Why? Because one should have another merits that he or she has evaluated before choosing eval uh, philosophy. There can be some commonalities. For example, in philosophy also and in ethics also, we end up studying 
uh, thinkers like Rawls and Gandhi. We end up studying uh, ideas like justice and accountability. But in that way, there can be overlaps with some other optional subjects also. So to choose philosophy, which in itself is a very interesting subject, one must have other reasons, not just that it will help me in ethics and there will be one less topic to study, one less subject to study. Let's go to next question. Is it necessary to use jargon or philosophical terms in answers? Here, I want to make this distinction very clear. Just because there is jargon used, philosophical terms used in your answers, it does not necessarily directly make your answer right. The idea is your answer has to be right, relevant and appropriate is more important than using jargon or philosophical terms in your answers. So giving good justifications does not always mean that you have to use jargons. If you can explain them well, articulate them well, then sometimes you can also not use jargons. Obviously, if you are using jargons, make sure that you know exactly what they mean. Philosophical terms, make sure exactly what they mean and you are free to use them whenever found necessary. Let's go to the next question. Can we use diagrams and flowcharts in answers? Answer to that question is absolutely. Why not? Please use them when you think it is appropriate. According to me, there can be only two intentions for using diagrams or flowcharts. One is that whatever you want to show through diagram, otherwise would take lot of words and you don't want to either write so many words or you want to finish uh, presenting that idea in lesser space. Second, what you're saying is very complex and writing it in words will not justify. So using diagrams can have very few intentions. One must surely not draw diagrams or flowcharts just to impress your evaluator just to impress the examiner. If there is any functional utility to di using diagrams, one must use it. In addition, when you write about case studies, there are various approaches like PESTEL, SWOT, and if you're using that, it is nice, it is imperative that sometimes you use these diagrams. It brings more clarity to examiner, to reader about what you are saying. Let's move on to the next question. Should I always give arguments for both sides of the issue asked? Now, this is an interesting question. This question is many times asked when people think about essays also. That do I always need to write with a balanced view? Now look, balanced views are always good. Who doesn't like a person who has thought about both the sides, knows merits and demerits of both the sides and can present ideas well. However, while you are choosing balanced ideas, it should not come off as you are being an escapist, you are being a fence sitter. That's surely not something, a kind of image that you want to put up for your examiner. Stand for what is right and oppose what is wrong. People like decision makers who are firm, who are willing to take stand because in real life, just having balanced opinions do not make decisions by themselves. People actually stand for ideas that they think are true and right and people vehemently oppose ideas which they think are wrong and should not be done. So while it is true that you should know both the sides of the issue, it is not necessary that you say, oh, so just let us consider both the sides. Taking stands is not a bad idea at all. Let's go to the next question. Can I give examples of politicians and contemporary leaders? Surely, why not? You must if you think that will help your answer. Just there is a little caution to exercise. Do not use any examples which are still controversial, where we do not know who is to blame, where the court hasn't given its verdict, when we don't know if facts of the case. Anywhere you're sure of the facts of the case, the court's verdict is already out. We know what was done right, what was done wrong, who was there, who wasn't there. Such cases you can always write. But then be very sure that you don't want to write something where just writing that example gives rise to further questioning. An example should always be clear. So avoid taking any polarizing views, divisive rules, or people who are just known for being divisive in society. Other than that, if you think there's any current affairs issue that will serve you well as example, please take it up. That is the whole point, that how can you connect values, principles, and learnings of ethics to real life. So why not? Please do it. 
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन शुड आई राइट इन बुलेट पॉइंट और इन पैराग्राफ दिस आई थिंक इज नॉट सो इम्पॉर्टेंट इफ यू हैव सब्सटैंशियल डेटा बट इन मेनी टाइम्स स्टूडेंट्स आर वेरी वर्ड आई फील आईदर इज फाइन देर इज एक्सरसाइज टू बी क्वेश्चन इन आईदर केसेस इफ यू आर राइटिंग इन बुलेट पॉइंट मेक श्योर दैट यूर राइटिंग इज कोहेरेंट इट इज नॉट लाइक सम माइक्रो नोट्स एंड यूर राइटिंग इन इनकम्प्लीट ब्रोकन फ्रेजेस इफ यू आर राइटिंग इन पैराग्राफ्स make sure that it they are not too lengthy where the examiner is lost for point so sometimes it's necessary that you highlight the point so examiner finds it quickly and reads around it and the last question what is a reasonable score to target in this paper i am going to say 100 plus is a very reasonable score it is possible that you might also exceed it and much more you might have seen that successful candidates especially toppers have scored much more even up to like 140 which seems almost unlikely in any other gs paper to score maybe except in sa but in gs 1 2 3 it is almost impossible to score 140 ethics gives you that space you need diligent preparation you need to plan it well you need to know your syllabus well and treat treat ethics as a subject most importantly as a complete domain of study and not something that you can do on the sides there's a prescribed syllabus upsc has looked at it as a as an interdisciplinary uh, domain of knowledge look at it very carefully and then if you have planned well i'm sure that crossing 100 should be a reasonable target for anyone who is writing mains with preparation these are some of the questions that i always came across we have also included it in our recent book which is an essential guide guide for writing answers in upsc's ethics integrity and aptitude to with the same hope that will help the readers let's hope it has helped you also thank you so much press the bell icon on the youtube app and never miss another update from the unique academy don't forget to like comment and subscribe to our channel stay tuned